On August 28, 1973, two men were in a 6-foot, 2-meter diameter submersible at the surface of the Celtic Sea after finishing an 8-hour work shift at the bottom of the ocean. Just before they were towed to the support ship and relieved of duty, the tow line became entangled with the aft machinery sphere, causing the submersible to take on water and plunge to the ocean floor 1,575 feet, 480 meters below. This is the story of the Pisces 3 dive disaster. A Canadian commercial submersible named Pisces 3 was operating off of the coast of Ireland on August 29, 1973. The Pisces 3 is 6 feet 2 meters in diameter and holds two people. The sub was built by International Hydrodynamics of North Vancouver, British Columbia to perform deep dives and to perform work in and explore the depths of the ocean. The Pisces 3 had been launched in 1969 and was purchased by Vickers Oceanic in 1971. Originally, the sub was built with tail fins. However, when the sub was purchased by Vickers Oceanic, the tail fins were removed to increase maneuverability. During testing in 1971, the Pisces 3, piloted by Peter Messervy of Vickers Oceanic, sank. The Pisces and Peter Messervy were rescued by the Canadian Defense Ministry. The tactics were corrected and the sub was put into operation. On August 29, 1973, the sub was piloted by Roger Chapman, a 28-year-old former Royal Navy submariner, and Roger Mallinson, a 35-year-old engineer. Both men were extremely experienced. Chapman and Mallinson were operating the submersible to lay transatlantic telephone cable on the seabed. This was a routine dive if a dive at 1,600 feet, 488 meters, can be considered routine. This was the 325th dive of the Pisces III. It had proven to be a very reliable submarine. Their job was to lay the telephone cable 150 miles, 240 kilometers, southwest of Cork. The entirety of this job was to take 20 days working 8-hour shifts. At 1.15 a.m., Chapman and Mallison descended for about 40 minutes to the ocean floor. The Pisces III had water pumps and jets that would liquefy the mud on the sea floor. They would use these jets to liquefy the mud, lay the cable, and then use the jets again to cover the cable on the ocean floor. The work was extremely difficult and exhausting. It was said to be like driving down the motorway in thick fog and trying to follow a white line. Furthermore, in order to see, they had to kneel down with their heads down by their knees while controlling the submersible in one hand and controlling the manipulator in the other. It took 100% of their concentration at all times. One pilot would operate the vehicle while the other rested, then they would switch. To add to the complexity and exhaustion, Mallinson had not slept for 26 hours prior to the dive. On a previous dive, the manipulator had been damaged, and Mallinson had spent the previous day repairing it. He had rebuilt the Pisces III when they had received it from Canada, so he knew the sub inside and out. When preparing for the dive, Mallinson also replaced a half-empty oxygen tank with a full tank. Though the half tank would have supported the dive, he had simply decided to change it anyway, giving them more air for the dive. During the dive, Mallinson and Chapman had to scrub the air. Every 40 minutes, they had to turn on a lithium hydroxide fan to absorb the carbon dioxide and release a small amount of oxygen into the cabin to keep the air breathable. This dive was successful, and after their 8-hour shift was finished, they began their ascent. They ascended and arrived at the surface at 9.18 a.m. As they were on the surface, they heard a tow line being attached to pull the sub alongside the support ship, the Vickers Voyager. They heard a voice over the radio say that the tow line was attached. This was immediately followed by a high-pitched whine. This noise was very familiar to Chapman and Mallinson. It was an alarm from the aft sphere. The aft sphere stored equipment and oil and was entirely self-contained. This alarm would occasionally activate, indicating moisture, and had always been activated by condensation. 
The alarm would stop as quickly as it started, and there was nothing to worry about. This time, it quickly stopped, but it started again. This was not normal. The sub then tipped back. The tow line had become tangled with the aft sphere and had opened a hatch, letting water into the aft sphere. If the fins had not been removed, the tow line could not have become tangled with the aft sphere, and this accident would not have happened. The sub began to tip further and further back, and along with the alarm came the sound of rushing water. The sub slipped below the surface, and Mallinson shouted to look at the depth. They were already at 100 feet, 30 meters and descending rapidly. At 150 feet, the sub came to an abrupt stop. The tow line had been pulled taut and stopped their freefall. However, the tow line was simply meant to tow the floating vehicle over to the ship. It was not rated to carry a large load such as the Pisces III. Just a couple of minutes later, a loud crack was heard as the tow line snapped and the Pisces III was again plunging into the ocean depths. As they descended, pieces were breaking off of the sub with loud cracking noises. To slow the descent, they dropped a 400-pound, 180-kilogram lead weight. They shut off all electrical systems and stuffed their mouths full of cotton as they braced for impact. The cotton would reduce the chance that they would bite their tongues off upon impact. With the electricity off, the sub plummeted in complete darkness for 30 seconds before impact. The Pisces III collided with the seafloor at 40 miles per hour, 65 kilometers per hour, but unbelievably stayed together. Chapman and Mallison were still alive, trapped at 1,575 feet, 480 meters, at 9.30 a.m. The men were trapped in a 6-foot, 2-meter diameter tube at the bottom of the ocean at a depth that is 10 floors higher than the height of the Empire State Building. At 9.45 a.m., Mallinson and Chapman had gathered themselves and made radio contact with Vickers Voyager above. They sent a status report that they were okay and in good spirits. They also reported that they had begun the dive with 72 hours of oxygen but had used 8 hours while working. They now had 66 hours left. They also knew that no one on the surface could reach them below, and it would take at least two days before any helpful equipment could be transported to the site. The men spent the first few hours getting organized and making plans to last as long as they could. It was cold and wet, and they had a limited supply of oxygen, and the sub was upside down. Carbon dioxide is heavier than air, so the men lay at the top of the cabin, to stay in good air. Also, by simply not doing anything and not speaking, a person can cut down on their oxygen usage to just one quarter of the normal amount. The men decided to lay completely still without speaking. Periodically, one would reach over to the other and squeeze his hand to let him know that he was okay. That day, the Royal Navy, the U.S. Navy, and the Canadian Coast Guard were informed of the emergency and all jumped into action. The Vickers Ventures in the North Sea was ordered to return the Pisces II submersible to the nearest port, while the Royal Navy's HMS Hecate was sent to the accident site with special ropes to retrieve the disabled sub. The U.S. Navy dispatched the submersible Curve 3 to the site. The Curve 3 was designed to pick up bombs and was loaded aboard the John Cabot, a Canadian Coast Guard ship, and they made their way to the accident site. The next day, on Thursday, August 30th, the support ship, the Vickers Voyager, loaded the Pisces II and the Pisces V in Cork at 8 a.m. and began their return to the accident site. This rescue effort was led by Peter Masservy, the very same diver that had been trapped in the Pisces III during training exercises. Peter Masservy was well aware of what the divers were going through and was extremely motivated to get them back. Chapman and Mallinson were in poor shape. They were exhausted, and if they both fell asleep, they might not wake up. They set egg timers for 40 minutes as a reminder to scrub the air. After 40 minutes, they would wait just a little longer to try and conserve just a bit more oxygen. This made them lethargic and drowsy, but in the end may save their lives. They also only had one sandwich and one can of lemonade, but they didn't want to eat them. 
they began thinking about their families. Chapman was 28 and had just gotten married. He thought about his wife and the future that she might have without him. Mallinson, on the other hand, was 35 and was married with four young children. He wondered how they would be if he didn't make it back. On Friday, August 31st, the Pisces II was the first to attempt a rescue. At 2 o'clock a.m., the sub descended with a polypropylene rope attached to a collapsible snap hook. However, the buoyancy of the rope caused the rope to be ripped from the manipulator, damaging the Pisces II. The next attempt was performed by the Pisces V, again with a polypropylene line and a snap hook, but this time the sub made it to the bottom. However, the Pisces III had landed in a trench and was barely visible on the sea floor. The Pisces V searched until the power was low and had to return to the surface, not finding the Pisces III and the men. At 1 o'clock that afternoon, on the Pisces V's second dive, the men were found. The Pisces V attempted to attach the rope, but again because of the buoyancy of the rope, the submersible was unable to attach it. The Pisces II again descended, but during descent, water flooded the sphere and the Pisces II again had to return to the surface. During these attempts, the Canadian John Cabot arrived with the U.S. Curve 3. However, it was soon discovered that the Curve 3 had an electrical issue and could not launch. Just after midnight, the Pisces V returned to the surface to join the other two disabled submersibles. With everything going wrong, at this point, hope for Chapman and Mallinson was almost gone. They had now been in the sub for longer than 72 hours, their window had closed, and there was no submersible that was currently capable of bringing them to the surface. The only thing that gave them hope and connected them to the surface was a group of dolphins. They had seen the dolphins on the 28th and could now hear them chirping in the water through the underwater telephone line. This gave them a connection to the surface that gave them hope. Knowing that the men were nearly out of oxygen, the surface crew had one last chance if it wasn't already too late. They sent the Pisces II with the line. This time, it was a success. Just after 5 a.m. Saturday morning, the Pisces II was finally able to attach a line. However, the line had been attached to the aft sphere. Mallinson knew that the aft sphere was a weak part of the sub and seriously doubted that it would be able to support the weight. Peter Messervy was not going to take any chances with a single line, so he did not attempt to raise the sub with the single line. At 9.40 a.m., Curve 3 descended and fixed a second line to the aft sphere. When the second line was attached, Chapman and Mallinson knew that they were not out of the woods yet, but shared the sandwich and the lemonade as there was no point in saving it now. At 10.50, the lift began. As soon as the sub lifted off of the surface, it began moving and spinning violently, completely disorienting the divers. The lift was slow, but progress continued until 350 feet, 106 meters, when it was stopped. Curve 3 had become tangled in the line and had to be removed. Once Curve 3 was detangled and it was safe, the lift continued until 100 feet, 30 meters, when it was stopped a second time. More and heavier ropes were added to stabilize the lift. The crew on the surface knew that the lift was extremely violent and didn't know if Chapman and Mallinson had made it. But at 1.17 Saturday afternoon, the Pisces 3 surfaced. When the crew looked inside, Chapman and Mallinson were alive to their disbelief. But they weren't done yet. The hatch had been jammed by the impact with the sea floor, and Chapman and Mallinson were almost out of air. It took 30 minutes to get the hatch open. The divers were finally free of the sub. They had been in the Pisces 3 for 84 hours and 30 minutes. The 72 hours of air that they had, they were able to extend by 12 hours and 30 minutes. When they were removed and checked the oxygen tank, they had only 12 minutes of oxygen left. This is the deepest rescue from a submarine in history. Both men physically recovered from the accident with only minor lingering psychological effects. Chapman became a leading authority on rescue submersibles and played an instrumental role in rescuing the seven-man crew of the Russian submarine AS-28 Pritz in 2005. 
Mallinson continued working for Vickers for several years and then restored steam engines. He and Chapman stayed in touch, meeting up every year until Roger Chapman died at the age of 74 in January of 2020. This is True Mysteries. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.